guys, just let us know if you guys have any comments or uh, questions of any kind. But um, I'll kick off tour. So, um, yeah, one, one question that stood out, and you, you touched on it there in the uh, in the presentation, was about uh, Pep Guardiola and the idea of uh, transitioning in after we lose the ball. So do we seek to stop play or do we seek the ball holder? So, yeah, I just that, I found that quite interesting because uh, you did mention... Um, Quite rightly, yeah, Pep, uh, Pep Guardiola has kind of steered away from that. And, and in recent games and seasons, that is, it's not really a trend now for his, for his team, but they're still very effective in the in the transition. So what, what do you make of uh, the importance of shifting from breaking up the play to going after the, the guy with the ball? Uh, like I, I said, um, this is from a slide that is main, meant to sell yourself as a coach and uh, I didn't want to put that controversial sentence there uh, even if it's what I uh, well if that's the last line to stop a counter-attack I, I would like my player to do it but yep. I would not stand in the dressing room and instruct them to do it yep. but if I had and of course uh, on a certain level you will have players able to think that and if they do it I would never punish them uh, but then again, if a player does it uh, too, too, too violently or too often violently, he will suffer himself and, and eventually we will suffer when, when he has to, to sit out games because of yellow cards. So, so there is no, you cannot say that you just want people to do it, but uh, you need to be clever and, and it's effective to, to, to use at least a lot of power to try to stop counterattacks early. You save your teammates for, let's say, 60-meter run. And then you can divide that 60-meter run with uh, maybe eight players. And you get some 100 meters every time it happens. And in the end, in the, you pass 80 minutes and, and it has affected the total running economy of your team a lot. So, yeah. so it's just, um, in my mind, it's just uh, mathematics. You, you yeah. need to to stop it as soon as possible if you can. Yeah, and especially with the fact that your your team is going to play an energetic way with mm. high intensity, you need to save the legs for as much as you can. Yeah, but my selling point towards the players is that if you are willing to, to run like a dog uh, in the first uh, three to five seconds, you save yeah. not only yourself, but the whole team from running uh, 40, 50, 60 meters each. Mm. Uh, so actually I've experienced and, and also now with the, the GPS data and so on, you can actually see that it's not more physically demanding to play a high pressing game than to uh, do the opposite and, and fall down every time you lose the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to one of the earlier slides when we first kicked off with you was about um, your zonal marking. And obviously now we've seen Bielsa making quite a good use of man marking, bringing that back. So yeah, just, just touch on that for us. What, what are the benefits of uh, zonal and versus man marking? Yeah, um, that's of course a big issue. And uh, to start with, I could say that that's what I'm grown up with. with uh, We've experienced in Norway uh, some success on the international level in the 1990s where uh, everything was 100% zonal based, both in the back line and, and midfield line. And that was at the same time as I grew up as a coach. It's just been so... Um, uh, it, it's, it's influenced... Uh, I've been influenced by it uh, through whole my to my whole career, so if I now um, I have had and I, I still do uh, some uh, adjustment towards uh, a man marking system in in the midfield, and mm -hmm. it's you know you have to look at this as a scale where you have the hundred percent zone yeah. defending on one hand and and the hundred percent man marking system of uh, old. Um, maybe Western Germany in the 1970s, uh, sure. on the other hand. And then that's a scale and you will 
very or you will be somewhere along that line and all my defending is much closer to the 100% zonal than, than the marking but I will make adjustments uh, and I can do in the midfield especially uh, at least um, restricted to uh, to following man in a certain phase of the game or uh, when the ball is in, in, in a certain part of the field uh, and then from there letting him move if he moves uh, further letting him move into uh, another player's zone but then again the other player picks him up and marks him so yeah. so it's like it's you cannot you cannot say either or, but there has to be uh, some floating uh, adjustments between. I, that's that's my um, the way I see it. Now, I like the visual idea of the scale. I think that that's yeah. something that's yeah. um, apply. I mean, not just to, to that particular aspect. You could apply that to any any part. I think so. I think that. so. Um, all right. I've got a couple of questions here. I was going to be greedy and ask another question, but let's get these guys in involved. I'm uh, just going to scroll up here. Okay. Uh, so this one, Kenneth, uh, what would be the focus for your first training on a new team? Uh, I just did that a few weeks ago. I should probably go back to my papers and see what I did. Um, um, my experience uh, has been that uh, if you think too much about it and, uh, and put too much focus on it, you'll get, you'll get nervous. Uh, so I, my advice is just to jump right into it. Don't make the first session a very complicated one. Uh, make sure that um, they, uh, you are not there to present everything that you are that you are as a coach on the first session. Make it a fun one. Make it a, a, a one with a lot of activity and less talking. And when they hear your voice, let it be. Uh, dominated by positive, uh, just uh, just enhancing or like uh, strengthening the things that they are already doing and, and be positive. Uh, that's what I would do. I think I played, um, we had a warm up with the fitness coach and we had uh, some simple kind of rondo where everybody gets to touch the ball and move and, and have fun. Uh, and then uh, we went on from there to play uh, three, three, three teams of seven at uh, um, half a pitch. And then the resting team was with the fitness coach. So, um, yeah, simple training with a lot of action. That was my first uh, session. Yeah, awesome. Okay, this is from Jens. How do you present your ideas of the game or style to a new team? Uh, well, um, with the um, with the possibilities we have uh, uh, from from digital point of view now, then you can of course do it with uh, video clips and with uh, presentations like like uh, something like the one I went through now. Um, then again, um, they will very easily or they will they will feel very fast whether you actually own this style and, and know what you want from, from what you are doing on the pitch. So uh, a fantastic professional presentation with everything clear and obvious on the screen will not, will not get you far. <laughs> so, so I would say you could, of course, use, if you're good with the digital tools, you could use that on a first meeting when you are presented as a coach. But then again, you have to get on the field and 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 show them um, how you how you can make it come across when you are on the pitch. That's that's the that will be uh, proven sooner or later anyway. So might as well just jump into it. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, one more question. Okay, from Dino, how do you periodize the different phases of the game during a training week in pre-season? Oh, that's a big question, and uh, I um, I could show you I have a week plan, uh, but uh, then I would have to go and search on the computer, so I don't want to do that right now. I can just explain in in words in in uh, the the broad lines that uh, in a normal uh, preseason week, I first of all I use the old style periodization with three levels. 
I call it a green week, a yellow week, and a red week. Uh, and uh, the green week is then with the lower demands. And I tell you after what the, those, how, how I classify that. And then the yellow is the mid, and then the red one is the hard week. And in this case where I work now, um, we are semi-professional, uh, which means that we are not, we don't have the luxury of controlling the total uh, uh, the total load of the player because some are students, some are part-time workers and so on. So um, therefore, I don't see the benefit of, uh, of a big periodization scheme. Uh, I only have these three levels and those three levels are determined with, for instance, if we have small-sided games on... Um, uh, on a certain day, let's say on a Tuesday, then I would play, let's say, uh, five times four minutes games per player uh, on a green week. Then on a yellow week, we would play uh, uh, six times uh, four minutes. On a red week, seven times four minutes. So the only thing I vary from a periodization point is the load within each uh, part of the training. If it was a full-time uh, uh, professional team uh, where you get them in in the morning, where you eat together, uh, you, you, can in, uh, you can control more or less everything about the player, uh, even uh, make him share how many hours he slept and all these things that they do on the top level. Then, of course, your periodization could be much more... Um, detailed um, because you would know that it influences each player more or less the same way and of course then again they would also have they take make blood tests and and so on so they would also monitor the health of the player in a different way uh, so that's uh, that's another level but where i work now uh, i need uh, easy tools and i do it like i told you with the three levels but the uh, hours used during a preseason week will be more or less the same uh, every week. And uh, that's because I have them only for one session a day and, and uh, I don't have much to vary on inside that. Others than uh, giving them an extra day off and in preseason, I, I don't do that. Um, then um, back to the week, uh, if you play a game, on Sunday, then I would like them to come in on Monday to have a, a recovery session, uh, partly run by the fitness coach. Um, some of the guys who didn't play that much can, can do uh, running or weightlifting. Um, and then we have, of course, the analyze of the game, get them together, watch clips from the game and so on. Then um, rest on the second day, and then the hardest training day on the third day. So if you played Sunday, uh, you, have, um, you have recovery on Monday, active recovery, and then all day off on Tuesday, hard training on uh, physical training on Wednesday, then again, Thursday and Friday, uh, more uh, bigger pitch and uh, more focus again on the coming game. So uh, smaller, uh, small-sided games in the beginning of the week and, and bigger areas closer to the game. Good stuff. Okay, so... Uh, that, that was very, like, an overall uh, thing, but I think we need an own session to, to go deep into the periodization when it comes to... Especially if you want to do it with a fully pro team because then it can be a lot more intricate. Yeah. I think still the, the fact you made a distinction there between what semi-pro a team might be able to do and with a uh, you know a fully professional team. I think that's that was an important distinction for us all. Mm -hmm. for that. And, um, okay, comment from Fatty. Not much of a question, more of a comment. He just was asking about your ideas about using the goalkeeper because in the formation pictures you showed, you didn't really show a goalkeeper. So. <laughs> well, and I'm a former goalkeeper coach, and that's a big mistake, of course. And, uh, <laughs> 
it's just down to the fact that I made it myself instead of copying from somewhere, some someone who's done it properly. So uh, I, you can argue that I play with 10 men. And uh, so uh, my apologies, the goalkeeper should have been there. Big <laughs> mistake. Okay, all right. Uh, all right, last question, guys, and then we'll, uh, we'll get back on with it, if that's okay with you as well. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, so question from James then, last one. Uh, so for the high press, what if a striker who regularly scores will not close down the opposition? Do you change the system to suit him or do you sacrifice his goals? Very good question. Um, I would say the last. Um, there is that. That's a really interesting question. I would, first of all, I will be standing on my head uh, asking that guy to start pressing. And he would probably have a really good reason why he shouldn't do it. And um, if he says that he needs to be rested uh, when he gets his goal scoring chances, I would say that uh, you need to become a professional. You need to start moving and get your uh, stamina up to speed. Um, so I don't, I have never experienced it that a player that is so important to the team just doesn't want to do what we are trying to do with the team. But eventually, if that happens to me, I will probably sacrifice him. Because I don't think as a, even as a principle, this can be discussed, I'm, I'm sure, but as a principle, we are doing a team sport and we need to find common ground that everybody can, can support and can be a part of and can, can enjoy. Um, and if one guy just doesn't want to do that, uh, do that game plan, then um, we cannot do it. And that's the question then, should we stop doing it just because of this one guy or should we try somebody else who, who can do it? And I would definitely do, do that. I would put up uh, some other striker and uh, uh, hopefully he will do well and, and he will prove to the, the goal scorer that uh, uh, he can do it as well. Or otherwise we don't really need that guy anymore if he's not running. Interesting uh, question. It's uh, ideas of culture as well. Like if you're from like an um, individualistic kind of uh, environment or culture, you know, where the individual is celebrated, you might have a coach who will allow for that player to do what he wants to do as long as he contributes. Whereas what you just said there is a kind of the opposite where you're looking to create that team harmony and cohesion across the board. So oh, well, you have yeah. to take into consideration that I'm a Scandinavian. I'm yeah. brought up in a, a social uh, system where, uh, where people uh, are taught to rely on each other and to oh. pull their weight in the system. Yep. Uh, so um, I would probably have to maybe uh, evolve or, or <laughs> I have to maybe have to change if I worked in another culture, uh, that's, which is really interesting. I was 16 months in an Arabic culture where uh, everything is really different. Um, uh, so yeah, um, like I said, my first approach would be to get the guy into the system. But yeah. uh, but I've also had had Brazilian player here in Norwegian top league, and and when I showed him that he was a striker, showed him the demands of the pressing from the two strikers, he said, "This is not possible for me. I'm I'm Brazilian. I, we don't play mm. like that." Yeah, and I said, "Well, here we do," <laughs> mm. and then uh, and then of course uh, we could joke about it. We could, and I had to uh, accept that he didn't have the he didn't have the stamina mm. to do it in the beginning. So he played, and he was a really good player. So he started games, and he was probably the first of the strikers to. Uh, to go off and, and uh, in that okay. system you very often you change strikers during the game because it's so demanding so uh, in the beginning he could play an hour and then after like three weeks he could play 70 minutes and then he built on it and and in the end uh, there was no question he could do mm -hmm. it and he did it as a as a part of his game and and we eventually sold him so he was successful in our team and yeah, yeah. it's but uh, yeah, if he said it's not possible and or if his fitness level was 
unimprovable. I don't know if that can happen to a player, but uh, yeah, I would uh, I would work really hard on that player to get him uh, over in my boat.